morning. I wasn't planning to preach today. We, uh, as elders, agreed that if Alan's shadow was not being cast on the door when we were done singing, that I would come preach God's word. So here I am. And Isaac, I'm using your water. <laughs> Two minutes. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I, as we were singing that last song, I thought, God, you need nothing, and I need everything right now. <laughs> and um, I was coming empty-handed with no sermon this morning. So let's just pray. I, I think we'll wait for Alan, if that's okay with everybody else. And um, the Lord is faithful and kind. And, and either way, his word, I trust, would have been preached today. So, Heavenly Father, Lord God, um, you are... Uh, a God who needs nothing, and you are uncreated, you're eternal, um, and that's hard for us to understand anything that happens outside of time, but that is you, God, you are awesome, and we, Lord, are very different in that way, we are creatures, and we are very needy, and we've seen our neediness this morning. Uh, you decided to open the storehouses of heaven and bring that amazing storm, and um, it caused accidents and traffic jams. And uh, We're very fragile, very needy, and Lord, just want to pause and pray for those in that accident this morning and pray for your mercy and grace on them. Uh, heal their bones and their bodies, and if their souls are not yet healed, I pray you draw them to Jesus through this trauma and that they would go into... Uh, be prepared to go into eternity. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us this last week. Um, we've all experienced trials, I'm sure, of varying degrees, and joys as well. And in trials and joys, we see in all of it, Father God, that um, our souls are not satisfied till they're resting in you. Um, we're not happy unless we're happy in Jesus. Our circumstances are constantly changing, and you alone are faithful. We fail each other, we fail ourselves, and you are faithful to forgive those who are your own. And we thank you. And just reflecting on Peter's denial this morning, um, knowing he would deny you, Jesus, you prayed for him, you had planned to strengthen him. Um, and you didn't leave him. And I know that look that you gave him after his third denial was, was, there was pain in your eyes, I'm sure, and sorrow. But there was no anger at Peter. And so if we've sinned this week, Father, and you've revealed those sins to us, I pray that we would not run from you, Jesus, but that we'd return to you. And that we would remember that all of our sins, past, present, and future, were taken on the cross where you absorbed God's wrath for us. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Father, we're in need of a, another pastor in this church. You know this. We need a preacher. And um, things with, with our brother Joshua did not go as we had thought they would go. And you knew this. It's no surprise to you, Father. And I pray as we work through this process that you would sanctify us that you would um, bring about repentance where it's needed, um, more faithfulness, that you would even in that trial, Father, help us to see that Jesus is the reason we gather. And um, this is his church. And Jesus, I just, uh, I just proclaim that once again. KBC is yours, and we thank you for that. And we thank you that you have prayed for us. You, you not only prayed for your disciples, but in John 17, it says you prayed for all who would be yours. And so you've prayed for us as well. Heavenly Father, uh, this town needs Jesus. This town needs him as a savior. Many people go about their business this morning, shoveling maybe or shopping, and uh, they don't have a thought towards you. And I pray that by your spirit and uh, through your word that you would reveal yourself to this town 
I pray you'd pour out your spirit here, Lord, and that you would draw many men and women, boys and girls, to Christ. And we bear a great responsibility as Kenora Bible Church to be a light on a hill. And we struggle with that, Lord. And I pray that you would strengthen us, that you would give us courage and boldness to not only have Christ preach from this pulpit, but to have Christ proclaimed from every home represented in this place right now. And that in our families, there would be a small glimpse of heaven as husbands serve their wives and give themselves up for them as they should. And as wives love their husbands and as children honor their parents. And as we do it all in the power of the gospel with the help of the spirit and with Jesus as our strength. Father, we pray for our missionaries. We thank you for them. We thank you for your calling on their life. We thank you that you are ensuring that the gospel goes forth to the nations. And we think of all the many reserves around here, Lord, that are a lot of them in darkness and without a witness to the gospel. And I pray there would be a witness to Jesus in every First Nations in this area. I pray there'd be a true church that is grounded in the word of God, that preaches the gospel. And I pray you'd strengthen Jamie, Lynn, and Rick, especially today and their family as they grieve and mourn. And I pray that would not hinder the gospel work happening there. And Lord, um, we're thankful that uh, your word will be brought to us this morning. We trust that uh, and hope that Alan will have made it. And we pray, Father God, that you will equip him and strengthen him to preach your word. We thank you for how you've prepared him already this week by your spirit and in his studies. And we trust that you have um, prepared something that will both convict and comfort and help us. And if anyone is here this morning, Father, anyone here who has not bowed the knee to Lord Jesus, I pray today would be the day and that they would see you as a good and gracious king and that they would have repentance and faith unto salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And Alan is here. Praise God. Thank you, Michelle. He's probably brushing the snow off. Oh, it's nice to make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's two semis involved in an accident there by Clearwater Bay. So, so the traffic was backed up and they had just started opening the traffic again. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you watch over everything in our lives and uh, even over accidents that happen and late arrivals and everything else. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of looking at your word this morning. And uh, we just pray that you would open our hearts, expand our our minds and hearts to grasp what you've done for us. And we just pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're looking at Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 6 today. And when, when thinking about God, I thought how opposite he is to this one character that I just read of this last week and was a Henrietta Green. And uh, she was known to be the richest woman in the U.S. at that time, like when, when she passed away in 1916. She was worth what would today be four and a half billion dollars and uh, owned thousands of properties and but uh, she was best known, though, for one other thing. She was the world's, Guinness Book World, biggest miser. And, uh, and she was famously cheap. 
In fact, she would only wash the hem of her dresses so that she could save on soap. And uh, one time her son Ned uh, was in a sledding accident and uh, he was seriously injured and she, she, she needed to get medical help and she, she finally found a free clinic. And when they found out who she was, they kicked her out and and uh, within a short time, her son got gangrene. And, and by the time she could get medical help, they had to amputate the leg. And she would live in cheap boarding houses. And I thought, boy, how different is our God? He is incredibly rich. But he is anxious to bless and anxious to give it out. And so we want to look at that this morning and in Ephesians 1, and starting at verse 3. And Paul has already wished them a blessing in verses 1 and 2, and especially while in verse 2, where he said, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can imagine Paul as he writes this greeting, Grace and peace to you. And then he starts pondering about the grace of God. And all of a sudden, the words just pour out of his pen. In fact, the next verses 3 to 14 in the Greek is one long sentence. And it's like, it's like E.K. Simpson said he... It's, it's almost like, like Paul is a, is a racehorse that all of a sudden gets going. And he can't stop. And he just keeps galloping. And, and he's halfway through the chapter until he can finally rein himself in. And then he does it for a prayer. But, uh, but Paul, I think when he thought about, about the grace and peace of God, Paul was just so overwhelmed and so amazed that Paul just couldn't stop. And this morning we want to just start looking at that. And uh, we'll, we'll try not to go too long. But uh, we want to look at Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 6. Or at least start in that part. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ... Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And Paul begins where I think we should always start as well. And he starts off by saying, blessed be God the Father. Praises be to God. And uh, Paul says that, that only God is worthy of praise because from him all blessings flow. And you might say, well, why is Paul so full of praise to God? Well, it's because of this, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has infinite riches and he is eager to share them. There are several things we should notice here, though. First of all, Paul says that God has blessed us in the heavenly realms. And you might say, what in the world does that mean? He has blessed us in the heavenly realms because five times in Ephesians, Paul is going to use this phrase, in the heavenly realms. For example, later on in verse 20 of chapter 1, Paul talks about there about how he wants believers to, to know and experience the power of God. And then he said, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead 
and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. And where these heavenly realms, Paul says, they are far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And so this heavenly realms is the place where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then what struck me in Ephesians 2 verse 6, where it's brought up again, and there Paul says, And God raised us up, we who were dead, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And we know that the heavenly realms is, is, is talking about the, the, a, a spiritual place. It's talking about, about a place where, where spiritual conflicts go on, for example. Because in Ephesians 6 verse 12, for example, he says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what does Paul mean when he says that we have been blessed with every blessing in the heavenly realms? What Paul is saying is that we are seated in a position with Jesus. If we have trusted in Christ and we are in Christ, we are seated in him and we are seated way above the power of any demons or principalities or authorities. We are seated spiritually, Paul says, with Christ. And Christ is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms. So the first thing Paul is saying here when he says he has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing, he is saying that our lives now, we may live on earth, but at the same time, we are living in a spiritual world. We are part of a spiritual conflict. We are part of a spiritual world where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And he says, and there he is blessing us with every spiritual blessing. And notice he says, with every spiritual blessing. Because... God owns the whole world. He owns, like it says, I think in Psalm, in one of the Psalms, it says that, that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And not only the cattle on a thousand hills, he owns absolutely everything. But it's interesting that Paul isn't talking about material blessings here at all. Paul is saying God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And John Stott suggests that, that the reason he says spiritual blessing is because these blessings come from the Holy Spirit. They are gifts and blessings that the Holy Spirit gives. Every blessing of the Holy Spirit has been given by the Father if we are in the Son. And so God has blessed us with every blessing. And, and, and I love Paul's use of superlatives. He doesn't say, and God has blessed us with the occasional blessing. No, he says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Warren Wearsby says, when you were born into God's family, you were born rich. Through Christ, you share in the riches of God's grace, God's glory, God's mercy, and in the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And so this is kind of the heading, you could say, for this whole blessing that Paul is going to share with them now. That's kind of the, the title, what he has just said. God is blessing us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. 
in Christ Jesus. And then he begins to list these blessings. And wow, they're amazing. Paul says, first of all, even before he made the world, and this is from the New Living Translation, it kind of amplifies it. He says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. <clears throat> the word that he uses here, chose us, is literally, literally translated, it, it, it would be he chose us for himself because it uses a tense where, where, where you'd say he chose us for himself. It's emphasizing that. And God chose us for himself. And you know, some people might say, well, is this a new thing to the, to the New Testament? It isn't. Because, because you have election and God choosing people all the way through the Bible. You have, for example, Abraham chosen. And picked out. And you have Israel that who was elected. Israel, the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, it says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out and redeemed you from the land of slavery. And so what Paul is saying here is, first of all, that that God chose us for himself. And he chose us out of a group of other people. In fact, this same word is used when, when, when he talks about, about choosing the 12 disciples. He chose the 12 disciples out of a whole group of disciples. Or he chose the 12 apostles. But he just chose 12, but there was a whole bunch there. And it's exactly, it's exactly the same word. He chose us for himself. Paul writes to, to Timothy, his son in the faith, in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. And, and Paul says, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave in Christ Jesus before the ages began. In other words, they were chosen. Paul was chosen. Timothy was chosen. Paul writes the same thing to the Thessalonians. He says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, beloved brothers, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And I'm always amazed that God chose me because I know myself quite well. And I, it always amazes me that, that, that God would choose me. And sometimes, sometimes, though, I think sometimes we like to think, well, yeah, but we chose him, didn't we? Well, Romans 3 tells us the plain truth in verses 10 and 11. It says, there is no one righteous. Not even one. There is no one who understands. No one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. And when he says that God chose us, what Paul is saying is that none of us would come by ourselves. 
In fact, John records Jesus' words in John 6 where, where, where Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then verse 65, Jesus adds, Because of this I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him to come. And that is why in the next chapter, Paul begins that next chapter in Ephesians by saying, we were all dead, and yet God made us alive through his grace. Alistair Begg had an article that I, 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 I read this last week, and, and uh, Alistair Begg writes, we might say, I know that God made salvation available to me, but I was the one who decided to accept it. I chose to follow Christ. Doesn't that make salvation something like a partnership between me and God? And then Alistair Begg says, that objection is true to this extent. Christians do repent and believe. That is true. But here's the rub you would never have been able to decide to do so if God had not first decided on you before the creation of the world. When you push back and back and back, you eventually push into the eternal counsels of the will of God. God realized before ever you first drew breath, so when did this choosing happen? Well, Alistair Begg referred to that already. But Paul says God chose us for himself. And then he says, before the creation of the world. And what I find really interesting here is he says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. And I think that's significant, first of all, that he chose us before the creation of the world. And Robertson Nicole says, this election is an eternal choice, a determination of the divine mind before all time. It is an eternal determination of the divine will and it has its ground in the freedom of God, not in anything foreseen in any subjects. And I think it's something that when we read it, we have to accept it. John Calvin preached 48 sermons on the book of Ephesians. And on this passage, he said, although we cannot conceive either by argument or reason, how God has elected us before the creation of the world, yet we know it by his declaring it to us. And experience itself vouches for it sufficiently when we are enlightened in the faith. In fact, he said election is the foundation and first cause of all blessings. In fact, what struck me here is that, that he says, we were chosen in him before the creation of the world. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That means that we were chosen before we yet existed. And not only that, we were chosen in Christ before Christ had even died on the cross. Because it, when it says from before the time of creation. And yet he says already then we were chosen in Christ. We were chosen in him. And so we might say, well, boy, that doesn't sound like I have too much to do with my salvation then. And what about my free will? 
And this is a thing that's been debated for years, is, is what about free will then? If, if God chooses us, do we have free will? In fact, some people actually say that God doesn't have omniscience. He doesn't know everything because if he knew everything and he knew that you were going to become a Christian, then you would have to become a Christian. You couldn't change it. So because there's potential, then what well, God maybe doesn't know everything. He doesn't know what's going to happen. But that is not true. God does know everything. God knows absolutely everything. And the amazing thing is that free will and God's election of us, it is not something that can't be reconciled. I like what the one writer said. He said, salvation is no precarious half measure, but a foundation laid in heaven. And he said, the Lord of all abides monarch in the kingdom of the human will without the least violation of its properties. And this person said, the lock is not forced, but opened. We are made willing to do our maker's will and we do it willingly. I love how Luke describes Lydia's conversion in Acts 16. And Luke says there, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Now, did Lydia willingly choose to accept Christ. She did. But the reason she did was because the Lord opened her heart. The Lord worked in her to make her willing. I still remember shortly before, 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 I, before I became a Christian, I was in full-fledged rebellion against God. And I told God that. I didn't want anything to do with him. But do you think he let me go? No way. He kept after me. There's a reason why someone has called him the hound dog of heaven. Because he keeps after people. And... And he used some pretty persuasive ways to work in my life. And especially a, a hellfire preacher. But did I voluntarily accept Christ or did he force me? He didn't force me. I voluntarily accepted him. I used my free will to respond to him. Paul himself was arrested quite abruptly on the Damascus Road. And I think Paul totally would say, yeah, I know that it wasn't from me because I was out there killing Christians. But then God got his attention. And with Paul, he used a two-by-four. But he got Paul's attention. And, and, and Paul willingly gave his life to Christ to follow him. And so, I think, I mean, God works in our lives in such a way, and he works in everyone's life whom he has chosen. He works in every life that he has, a person that he has chosen, and they do not choose him against their will, but they willingly respond to him. Warren Wearsby says, does the sinner respond to God's grace against his own will? No. He responds because God's grace makes him willing to respond. The mystery of divine sovereignty and human responsibility will never be solved in this life in some ways. Both are taught in the Bible. 
We choose God freely only because in eternity God had first chosen us. We decide for Christ only because in eternity God had first decided for us. That is why we respond. In fact, John Piper wrote this. He said, if God watches and waits, as it were, for us to act, and then in response to that self-generated act, he chooses us, then we're not chosen by divine grace. Then we're chosen by a decisive human act. But the thing is, God isn't just a responder. God determined what would happen. And so we have a free will to respond, just like people have a free will to reject. But God is the one that works in us to respond to him. And that's why Paul always emphasizes both. He emphasizes the sovereign purpose of God. But at the same time, Paul always emphasizes we are offering the gospel to everyone. And you see this in John 3.16, for example, too. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Paul says, in, in, in another passage in, in Romans 10, Paul says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. And God is going to work in people's hearts. And I think sometimes when we pray for people, what we ought to pray is not in a sense, Lord, help them be good enough to respond. But what we need to pray is, Lord, open their hearts. Open their hearts to respond to the gospel. We are praying this for some loved ones of ours. We're praying, Lord, open his heart to respond to you. Because only and, and the thing is, only, only those will respond, though, whom God has chosen before the creation of the world. But everyone who responds, he will accept. In fact, Romans 10, verses 11 to 13, it says, as Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So why does Paul emphasize this so much? I believe Paul emphasizes the sovereignty of God and God choosing us before the creation of the world. Because Paul doesn't want our salvation and our hope and our trust to rest on our fickle nature. He wants it to rest solidly on what God himself has done. And there's another reason why Paul wants, wants us to know that God has chosen us before the creation of the world. And that is because when God chose us, he had a purpose. Why did God choose us before the creation of the world? God chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. So if, if someone would say, well, boy, maybe God chose me from the beginning of the world or before the world began, so, so I'm saved, so now I can live any way that I want to. Paul would say, oh, horrors, no. You can't. Because why did God choose you before the creation of the world? 
He chose you for the purpose that you should be holy and blameless in his sight. Did you know that being holy and blameless is not an option for us? If we come to Christ in faith, that is not an option. We cannot say, well, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll go that route. I, th I think I'll try to be holy. Paul is saying, you were chosen to be holy and blameless. And being holy, he has already referred to that when he called these people in Ephesus saints. It's the same word. And it, and it basically means, holiness means to be set aside, to be consecrated to God. To be set aside from what is common to what is pure and holy. And so holiness has connotations of, of purity, moral, moral purity. But also of being consecrated to God. And Paul says... That we were saved, we were chosen, so that we should be holy and blameless. And this word blameless can also be translated without blemish. In fact, that's the way it is translated often. Again, Alistair Begg said, we haven't been chosen because we are holy. We have been chosen in order that we might become holy and in turn bring glory to God every step of the way. And that is why God has chosen us. In fact, John Stott made the comment, he said, ultimately, the only evidence of election is a holy life. A holy life is the evidence of election. And it's evidence that we've been chosen by God before the creation of the world to belong to him. And so we have been chosen to be holy. And I see by the time we won't go into this next one, which is predestined to adoption as son and daughters and we'll we'll leave that for next time but i just like to like to go back go a little further though why does god do both these things why does he choose us before creation and why does he adopt us to sonship and the answer is to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. I love that. To the praise of his glorious grace. If you read through these first, these, these uh, 12 verses or 11 verses, whatever it is, this one sentence that Paul has, you will notice three times he uses that phrase, to the praise of his glory. But this is the only time that he uses it in the sense that to the praise of his glorious grace. And he brings that out. Because it is pure grace that God would choose us before the creation of the world to belong to him. And it is pure grace that he would predestine us to be sons and daughters. So it is to the praise of his glorious grace. And we as believers can rest assured that we belong to God because he has chosen us before the world began. And he chose us in Christ even though Christ hadn't even died at that time because this was before the creation of the world. We were chosen in Christ and before the foundation of the world. And uh, I, I kind of think that, that one way we could look at this, this whole thing of election and our free will, is 
picture a big sign over a church door. And the big sign over the church door says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall be saved. And as many as received him, to them, who, to those who believe in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And you see this big sign outside and you say, Yes, I feel God moving in me. I want that. And you come inside. And then you look outward and you look at the sign above the door now. And the sign above the door says, For he chose you in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined you to, for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. What amazing grace. What does this do for you as you think about this? How does your heart respond? When you realize that before creation, God already had his eye on you. God already said, that person is going to be my child. And then, years later, we hear the gospel. And we respond. And the, the only reason we respond is because the Lord opened our hearts. And we walked in. Chosen from before the world began. I hope that that floors you. I hope that that just makes you think, wow. How can that be? And especially when we realize how sinful we are and how undeserving. And it's all because of the grace of God. And perhaps there's someone even this morning who, who, who has never accepted that offer of salvation, who has, who has seen that sign that says, everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus will be saved. But if you've never done that, you need to do that and respond to him. That is our part, simply responding to when the Lord opens our hearts. And then living for his glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, thank you so much for the message in your word. That you chose us. You chose me. You chose each one of us here who, who knows you. You have chosen us before the creation of the world. You've blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Oh Lord, help us to revel in that. To, to just praise you. And with hearts full of love and gratitude, Lord, help us to, to live our lives holy, separated to you and blameless without blemish. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know you, I pray you would open their heart to respond to you. Thank you so much for your amazing love. In Jesus' name, amen.